Hey, welcome back to the About the Labor podcast here at VikingsTerritory.com. I am BJ Rydell, back here with my guy, Drew Mahold. Uh, today, we're talking some Week 2 action. Minnesota's heading to Heinz Field to battle the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, so we're going to do a full uh, now analytical preview of this matchup. Uh, we'll start off first with some injury updates, keep you guys up to speed with the Vikings injury report, and then we'll jump right into Pittsburgh. So this is going to be primarily a uh, individual matchup show and a general assessment of um, what Pittsburgh has uh has to offer and what the Vikings are up against this coming weekend. So, as always, let's start off with a word from our sponsors here. Uh, Blackstack Brewing, brand new brewery smack dab in the middle of Minneapolis and St. Paul with a wide range of clean and flavorful brews and a massive bright tap room, perfect for the intimate settings, all the way to special events. That's Blackstack Brewing, 755 North Pryor, just north of Menards, off of University Avenue. And then shout out to our sponsors over at the Twin Cities Directory, the best way to explore delicious bites and fun-filled nights that Minneapolis and St. Paul have to offer. Check it out at www.twincities.directory that's www.twincities.directory helping you discover the real twin cities all right drew uh not a whole lot uh to update as far as injuries go um, obviously we just recorded the most recent show yesterday so uh, not a whole lot has changed over the last 24 hours here um Major news on that front, I suppose. Uh, Anthony Barr is still being held out of practice. So uh, if you weren't worried early on in the week, as we suggested you probably shouldn't be, uh, now is the time to potentially start getting a little nervous that Anthony Barr won't play this week. Um, I still think that it's probably a good chance that he's going to play. I'm just saying now that he's sitting out a Thursday practice as well, um, you know, it's uh, it's getting close uh, to Sunday here for Anthony Barr. Uh, so right. little reason for concern there. But other than him, uh looked like Tremaine Brock returned to practice in a limited capacity. Sam Bradford still limited, still not buying into that at all. Don't think that's a big deal. Um, anything from you, Drew, in terms of what you're seeing from the Vikings' recent updates and general injury report here? Um, well, I think the big key with Anthony Barr is it's going to be Friday. That's generally what the, is an indicator for you know players that don't practice Wednesday, Thursday. Um, if they do suit up on Friday, Generally, that means they will play, and if they don't at all practice in any capacity on Friday, it's generally a good indication that they will not play. So, most people by now, when they listen to some people when they listen to this by now, will already kind of know Bar's fate to an extent based on his status for Friday's practice. So, um, just keep that in mind. Um, If he does not practice Friday, I would assume then that he does not suit up, and vice versa for if he does practice. So, and if he doesn't practice. Friday and if he doesn't suit up then I would assume you know Manuel Lemur will step in um, you'll have I think maybe some Eric Wilson in there it'll be it won't be just one guy but I do I, I would assume then the Vikings would probably move Gideon in there with Kendricks in the nickel and have you know I, I would assume that would be the case so that that could be detrimental really because that bar Kendricks duo has kind of been you know they kind of need each other in a way so I don't know I'm not that concerned yet but I, I think it could be really bad if he misses that game. Yeah, absolutely. This is definitely a game that Anthony Barr needs to play in. Uh, based off of his skill set, based off of what Pittsburgh uh, has to offer, um, it, you know, strictly on paper alone, Anthony Barr is an absolute uh, necessity uh, for this Vikings defense uh, based on you know what he's asked to do within Zimmer's scheme. Uh, you take him out of the equation, all of a sudden you're uh, dropping either Eric Wilson or Ben Gideon Either way, you got a rookie uh, dropping him into coverage against guys like Le'Veon Bell, asking those one of those two guys to pass rush, um, you know, against a very mm-hmm. experienced offensive line and a very experienced quarterback. It's just, it's, it's not a good way to get off to a matchup that the Vikings probably are facing an uphill battle here. Um, that's the, you know, that's the obvious answer, the obvious statement here. Um, if Anthony Barr misses uh, the game on Sunday, that's going to be a problem. But at the same time, uh, like Drew said, we'll wait till Friday uh, to jump to any major conclusions here. But uh, just keep in mind that we might be seeing some extended reps from Eric Wilson this week. Um, regardless, honestly, if Anthony Barr is genuinely injured and uh, needs to be held to just a limited capacity on Sunday, this could be uh, this could be the game that we see a little bit more action for Eric Wilson. So, um, all that said, um, let's talk more about the guys that we do know will be playing on Sunday uh, and the guys that you know are going to be difference makers for both the Vikings and the Steelers. So, um, yep, 
let's start with the with Pittsburgh on the offensive side of the football. Um, so the Vikings defensive side. Um, we'll start with quarterback Ben Roethlisberger. Um, obviously, one of the greatest of all time. A um, couple Super Bowls to his name. He's got. He's a large reason why this team is considered to be uh, arguably the favorite in the AFC, aside from the New England Patriots. Um, what do you see from Ben Roethlisberger, Drew? Obviously, the Vikings have played him multiple times in the past. Uh, Mike Zimmer, of course, being from Cincinnati, has played him multiple, multiple times in the past. Um, they know each other. We all know yeah. this guy, uh, but he still keeps chugging along. Uh, what do you think of Ben Roethlisberger? Yeah, I think, I mean, he's definitely on the back nine of his career. Probably the final, if you want to get that creative with the golf metaphor, the final, what, two holes of his career. Um, he's he's on the downslope, I think. Um, yeah, We're starting to see kind of him, I think he still sometimes plays as if he is still 27, 28, 29 years old, trying to make plays that he maybe cannot anymore. Can't, can't make those plays anymore. So uh, we saw that a little bit in Cleveland last week, um, but... You know they 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 got a win. It wasn't it wasn't um, pretty, but I think I think he, he he struggled and he showed some weaknesses that I think this Vikings defense can exploit. Because while the Browns do have some talent on that defensive side, um, I think it's pretty clear that the Vikings boast much more talent, much more um, production as well. So um, I, I think Ben is exploitable. I, I don't think he's the the elite quarterback that he was you know five years ago. I still think he's pretty damn good, though, right? Obviously, uh, you know, he may not be the Ben Roethlisberger that, you know, threw that unbelievable pass in the Super Bowl to Santonio Holmes to clinch a, a ring, or the rookie that, you know, took a team 15-1 and won, um, way back when and, uh, you know, has been – he's been extremely consistent throughout his entire career, right? Uh, I don't think the drop-off even between him at his most – at, at his absolute peak, the drop-off to him now is not super significant. Obviously, like you said, the mobility stuff, I'm sure that he's been beaten up. He's been beaten to a pulp throughout his career here. So uh, the fact that he's not running around, uh, not you know, t- taking off out of the pocket nearly as much as he used to, um, going down a little bit easier than the Big Ben of old, uh, but he's still mm-hmm. dynamic. Uh, this is a vertical passer that – has been able to get the ball to his to his playmakers throughout his career, and that's part of the reason why he's been so successful. Um, and part of the reason why he's still so successful now is because he has such great playmakers around him, such great playmakers that can do a number of different things. Um, so Ben Roethlisberger was the was kind of the. He was kind of the guy that made the Steelers go way back when. Plus, the, it was their defense. Plus Ben Roethlisberger. Now it's kind of shifted to. In my opinion, it's become more the Le'Veon Bell show and the uh, Antonio Brown show, and we'll kind of see what we yep. get from Martavis Bryant. Obviously, everyone knows he's a freak, but he's had some off-field concerns. So um, let's start with Antonio Brown here because I think that he's probably uh, the most multidimensional weapon that they have. Obviously, he's arguably the best receiver in the league. We all know that, uh, but the way that Pittsburgh utilizes him uh, and gets the ball in his hands so that he can, you know, not only uh, catch, you know, quick balls, create first downs, but also the yards after catch. They set him up nicely. Todd Haley does a great job designing plays to get Antonio Brown in space and allow him to use um, that kind of that punt return mentality um, that we saw early on in his career. So um, what are you seeing from Antonio Brown on film that, you know, obviously we know he's super good. Obviously we know we can do a bunch of different things, but is there anything specifically that jumps out to you about this guy um, heading into Sunday's matchup? Well, I, for one, I think this whole idea of a Xavier Rhodes versus Antonio Brown showdown where they'll be matched up head to head for, you know, 40 snaps or something like that. Um, I don't think it's going to happen um, simply because Antonio Brown is a freak in the slot. He's dominant and teams rarely have an answer for him. I even remember the last time these two teams played before Mike Zimmer was around. Um, I I think he had 10 catches in that London game in 2013 um, in that loss. But, you know, still, um, the guy can play out of the slot, and Xavier Rhodes is not covered in the slot very much, and I don't think he has a skill set to do so. So if the Steelers are smart and if Todd Haley is smart, um, he's going to put Antonio Brown in the slot, and he's going to let him wreak havoc on the Vikings secondary. And that matchup, I I mean, I don't see an answer. Um, Terrence Newman has played some slot. He's 39 years old. Tremaine Brock may come back and take some of those reps as well. 
But again, uh, Brown's just too elite at that, and I think that's going to be the difference here. If, if, if he can be contained out of the slot, the Vikings still have a chance. But if he erupts like he did against Cleveland, I don't think they'll, the Vikings have a fighting chance, really. Yeah, you know, this is the... This is a guy here, he's sort of like Drew Brees, right? When we talked about the New Orleans Saints last week, we talked about the fact that Drew Brees is the type of guy where he's going to get his at some point during the game. We saw last week it took him all the way uh, until the fourth quarter to get that passing touchdown, but he did get it, and he did end up still throwing for about 290 yards. That's just par for the course for Drew Brees. Well, same can sort of, you know, relatively speaking, relative to the receiver position, same can sort of be said about Antonio Brown. This is a guy that's probably going to catch five balls. He's probably going to ha- turn in 50, 60, 70 receiving yards. That's just kind of what he does week in and week out. At the out. least. Right. At the least. Right. So seeing Antonio Brown catch a few passes on Sunday shouldn't be, you know, a major concern. It's the explosive plays that you have to, obviously, you have to limit. You know, that goes without saying every week, but with a guy like Antonio Brown who is so dangerous, you need to be efficient tackling. You need to, you know, get in front of him and not allow him to, you know, work his magic in space because he is very dangerous with the ball in his hands. Um, And like I said before, Todd Haley does a great job getting him open. Uh, If you look last week at Cleveland, Cleveland's uh, at the game against Cleveland, the film, uh, you saw Todd Haley do a lot of stuff to essentially one and three step drops, basically uh, Big Ben taking the ball from under center and essentially finding Antonio Brown immediately just to get him the ball. And that's creating three, four, five yards sim- pretty much every single time because he is so yeah, good. And at then creating. you have guys downfield too running routes down the field that are set up to, you know, get Brown on you know, blockers in front of him as well to create extra space for him and extra opportunities for him to get down the field. Right, right. So the big thing with Antonio Brown is that Todd Haley does a great job make, p- calling plays that set up other plays, right? So you'll see three, four, five quick hitters in a row. They might not even run the ball with Le'Veon Bell in the middle of those, uh, in the middle of that series. And then all of a sudden they'll try to hit you deep. And like I said before, Roethlisberger is critically accurate downfield. Uh, he's been one of the better uh, 40 plus yard passers, uh, excuse me, 25 plus, well, 40 plus yard passers too, because he's been able to accomplish that as well. But 25 plus in the air yard passers um, over the course of the last couple seasons or so. And obviously Antonio Brown is a big piece of that. Um, but you know, to simplify it here, Brown is going to get his on Sunday, whether it's against Xavier Rhodes, Trey Waynes, Mackenzie Alexander, Tremaine Brock, Terrence Newman, whoever it is, um, he's going to get his to some degree. Um, it's a matter of limiting the damage, keeping him under like 125 yards receiving because he, this is, this is like a two pronged attack, right? If you, if you're able to limit Antonio Brown and limit Le'Veon Bell, who we'll get to shortly, um, this is an offense that has a lot of question marks, obviously plenty of talent, but a lot of question marks beyond those two guys. Right. Yeah, I mean, beside, I mean, when I mean, you have the two, probably the two most talented skill position players in the NFL, your offense is going to be good no matter what. Sure. Um, Le'Veon Bell and Antonio Brown are probably those two guys. But, uh, I mean, Martavis Bryant obviously has a bunch of talent, but he's been out of the league for a while, and you wonder if there's some rust. I don't think he had much of a game last week against Cleveland. Eli Rogers has been pretty inconsistent. And then, um, you know, they have something named Jesse James, a tight end who, by the way, did catch two touchdowns last week. But um, the, the point, I mean, point is besides those two guys, I think it's, you can match up any of the Vikings secondary or linebackers um, against the Steelers. Other guys, I guess you can say other guys besides Brown and Bell, and you should have the upper hand there. It's just limiting what they do between Bell and Brown. Cause I mean, on a weekly basis, they combine for over 200 yards um, at least. So that's that's a lot of offense to, to contain out of just two guys. Yeah, and on top of that, those two guys act as, you know, just inherent decoys as well. Just when they're on the field, um, they make things happen simply by standing there and having to have um, defenses hold them accountable. Um, obviously, when you see uh, Antonio Brown lined up wide and single coverage on the outside, you probably have to flow to safety over yeah. the top. Um, just – no, you don't necessarily know that he's going to go deep, but the fact that he can go deep and the fact that he is so creative with his routes when the play breaks down. Uh, we, there was one particular play uh, last week where uh, 
he ran his route from the right side of the field and he crossed over and it was it was clear that he was running probably an eight or a, a seven or an eight route and just over the course of Ben Roethlisberger extending the play he floated all the way over to the left side of the field and Roethlisberger basically just heaved it up and said go get it and he came down with it so that's the type of chemistry that Roethlisberger and, and Brown have together and just simply if the play breaks down and the Vikings aren't able to get you know get to Ben Roethlisberger and you know, two, three, four seconds. Uh, it's just creating more opportunities for guys like Antonio Brown, who do so well at finding the soft spots in zone and simply finding a way to get open um, when nobody else is. Right. Uh, that's what he does so well, and that makes other guys dangerous as well. So, uh, we talked a little bit about Martavis Bryant here and there um, last week. Six targets, only f- two catches for 14 yards. Not exactly uh, the welcome back to the NFL he was probably looking for. Um, Obviously, it wasn't a great week for Pittsburgh as a whole, um, but Bryant is a guy with considerable talent, and like I just said with Brown, when, you ha- when you're when you forced to play a safety over the top on Brown, you end up getting Martavis Bryant matched up in one-on-one coverage on the outside, and this is something that we'll have to wait and see. It's kind of a narrative for this season, um, but Martavis Bryant certainly has the talent to really make teams play and one on make teams pay in one on one coverage uh, because he is that freak athlete. Uh, he's dangerous with the ball in his hands or with the ball in the air. Uh, he could do so many things. It's just been a matter of can he get his head straight? Can he get his you know um, substance abuse? Right. issues under control uh, but when he's on the field this is an extremely dangerous playmaker and one that you know whether it's Rhodes covering him on the outside while Antonio Brown is in the slot or it's you know Trey Wayne's on the outside uh whatever whatever you know configuration the Vikings elect to go with uh, defensively Martavis Bryant is going to be a handful and he's the type of guy that is you know he's given greater opportunity to succeed because of guys like Antonio Brown Right, yeah, he's kind of, you've seen the last few years when he's been in the game um, and not suspended that he can produce quite well when you have Antonio Brown on the other side, you know, or in the slot with you. Um, so, he, he, I mean, the guy, I mean, his spectacular catch rating on Madden probably should be about 95. Um, we've seen him make all kinds of these spectacular plays that should not be made by a normal receiver. So, um, Trey Waynes and or Rhodes and or, I guess, whoever it would be, I really, again, I really don't think there's going to be one-to-one matchups this week it's going to be based on how pittsburgh and todd haley kind of scheme things because again of brown the slot so uh, but whoever is defending brown and um, um, so you know wayne's got beat by tommy lee lewis last week and you know had a pass interference as well so keeping him and contain keeping bryant contained as well um is certainly important yeah and uh on top of you know Towards the bottom of the depth chart, obviously the guys that are going to really stick out at the re- wide receiver crew are the two that we've talked about in Brown and Bryant. But they've got some playmakers as well. Uh, Darius Hayward Bay, everyone knows him being one of Al Davis's last picks in Oakland. A guy that ran about a 4 2 5 40 in college and vaulted himself into first-round pick uh, territory, or at least for on Oakland's uh on Oakland's big board that year. Uh, but he's basically a 7-8-9 route exclusive type guy. Same could be said about Eli Rogers, who is the guy that's primarily the wide receiver three here. But then you've got the rookie Juju Smith-Schuster out of USC who saw um, extended uh, extended snaps last week and could con- you know continue to build um, a greater role in this offense as the season progresses. But um, like I said here, primarily the guys you have to worry about here are Antonio, Antonio Brown and Martavis Bryant. If you're able to contain the two of them um, – the rest of the receiving group is not all that threatening, especially considering, um, you know, who the Vikings have covering these guys. Um, you know, the three, number three, number four wide receivers. I like the Vikings matchups um, in terms of, you know, mm-hmm. individual defensive back matchups. So, um, on to the running back position, Le'Veon Bell. We've already talked about him quite a bit here. Um, the other guy here is James Conner, the cancer survivor from Pittsburgh. Uh, Conner is basically the guy in the backfield right now that just kind of, when Le'Veon Bell says he can't take, when he can't, you know, take a snap or he needs a blow or whatever, James Conner gets a carry. But he's by no means a difference maker on the Steelers team, at least not at this point in his career. Um, great feat for him but just to get to the NFL, but he's by no means um, a playmaker on this offense. It's all about the Le'Veon Bell show. Um, talk to me about all the different things that this guy can do and all the different you know uh, issues that he creates just by being on the field against the Vikings this week. 
Well, I think when I looked at Joe Mixon film from Oklahoma, he um, accelerates really well, and he can he can line up as a receiver and run routes and beat linebackers and beat DBs. Um, and that was Joe Mixon at, at the FBS level. Le'Veon Bell does the same thing in at probably as dominant a fashion at the NFL level. Um, he is very versatile in that way, um, and he you know is super again everybody knows this about lady on bell but super patient and he's willing to wait um and let things open up before he um, attacks the hole so um the vikings love to be very uh disciplined in their gaps and um you know you're not getting too aggressive with it we've seen that in the past with some of these guys um especially with these linebackers kendricks and bar like to do that sometimes so staying disciplined in the gaps and kind of letting bell come to you before you you try and make a play it's going to be important because that seems to be the mistakes that um, that Levan Bell takes advantage of on the ground. Absolutely, yeah. Like you said, he's got great patience to line of scrimmage, um, extreme like unparalleled vision, um, ball carrier vision. Once he uh, you know once he hits the line of scrimmage, he finds you know the correct gap to run through. Um, you know, ninety eight percent of the time, uh, he's just he's so great at you know. It, Players that, you know, reach a certain blue chip caliber level, they say the game, quote, slows down for them. Well, Le'Veon Bell is a player that mm. literally looks like he's playing in slow motion all the time. Uh, he gets to the line of scrimmage. It looks like he literally goes straight through the line, reads every single gap that he could potentially choose to go through and decides on the perfect one. He like, you know, he's doing all of these things in mm -hmm. a fraction of a second. Um and on top of that, he's extremely explosive. He can make – he's elusive. He can make guys miss. He can break tackles. Um, he finishes his runs with authority. He's a smart player as well. Um, so on top of being very consistent about picking the right hole to run through, um, he does a nice job in the open field in terms of getting himself into space um, You know, with defenders um, closing in on him. Uh, he's just he's simply the best running back in the NFL right now. Um, he can do so many things as a oh, yeah. rusher. He can do so many things as a pass catcher. This is a guy that can literally run routes as good or better than most receiver. You know, I don't want to say most receivers, but a, a handful of starting receivers in the NFL. Le'Veon Bell is right on par with them in terms of route running. Um, crisp, you know, athletic routes where he breaks off the stem and creates separation just kind of inherently. So he does so many different things well. Um, he's like Antonio Brown in that he's going to get his at some point. It's just a matter of how much. Um, Cleveland did a great job last week of containing him, and part of that was keeping – Keeping Pittsburgh in second and third and long situations where they're not, you know, it's not exactly a favorable situation to run the ball with Bell. Uh, yeah. That's a good way to, you know, to limit the damage there. Um, one of the and then of course one of the best ways um, to limit any running back we've heard this for years with Adrian Peterson is simply take the ball out of his hands uh, be consistent offensively extend offensive drives wear down the opposing defense control right. the clock uh, basically game management is the best way to slow down guys like Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell because if you manage the if you manage the game uh, well. Uh, if you if you're able to you know keep your offense on the field and your defense off the field consistently, that's you know inherently limiting the touches of these two you know extremely talented playmakers. Um, obviously, there's only so many snaps in a given game, uh, so if you can basically hold them to say 35 right. touches in total between the two of them, uh, you're probably sitting in a much well, better. That'd be that'd be phenomenal. Yeah, I would take that. I mean, honestly, you know, Antonio Brown is a guy that probably draw. I mean, how many targets did he draw last week? Uh, he drew 11 targets, had 11 receptions. Le'Veon Bell had 10 carries um, and also had uh, three receptions on six targets. So between the two of them, 27, and they, 27 targets um, slash touches yeah. for the between the two of those guys. So Cleveland had the recipe for success. They simply just didn't do enough offensively, and they weren't able to limit. Jesse James, who was the guy that kind of took advantage of the situation last week um, with Le'Veon Bell not right. really able to get it going on the ground. Ben Roethlisberger was able to find Jesse James, who has been kind of a work in progress since coming out of college, but he's really beginning to um, look like a very effective safety blanket and uh, kind of a third cog, well, third or fourth cog, depending on your v standpoint on Martavis Bryant within the Steelers offense. Right, and I think um, the 
the main thing I take away from watching that Steelers Browns game is that um, you know the Steelers converted in the in the red zone. You know when they got those chances, and the Vikings were able to hold the Saints quite effectively last week. So um, and, and Jesse James was one of the primary targets in the red zone. So um, that will be something to note in in those situations is you know Big Ben looking for Jesse James, looking for the big body, um, the big the big frame target in the red zone, and who's going to end that. And how the Vikings, um, you know, take care of that because I, I think he immediately, you know, goes up the priority list of you know players to defend. I guess um, quite significantly in, the, in those, um, you know, limiting him um, obviously is important. But I think that was the difference for the Steelers last week was just they converted in those red zone situations and it was the difference in almost losing to the Browns. Um, you know, if they get a field goal one one of those times, it's a different ball game completely. Um, I, mean, I think we've said this already, but the Steelers did not play particularly well. Um, and right. part of that was the Browns. I think they kind of you know, were a little bit better than people expected as well. But uh, they, they didn't win that game. It came down to that last Big Ben and Brown thrown catch. Um, so Jesse James, two touchdowns were very important. And I think, obviously, um, you know, taking away your top touchdown scorer, um, it would be a, a nice a nice. Um, way for the Vikings to get a head start in that red zone battle. Well, yeah, I mean, Cleveland kind of laid out a, a good a good blueprint for how to beat Pittsburgh, right? Um, obviously, they were unable to come through the final score, 21-18, to 18, if you didn't happen to catch that one. Um, but the number one reason why Cleveland lost was it was very Browns of them. Uh, the You know, essentially... Uh, before, yeah. before the Steelers' offense even got on the field, they blocked a punt, and the defense came up with a touchdown yeah, that that's set right. them back seven nothing immediately. So, I, I know this is cliche, and I know that every coach says this at every press conference. But if you limit the turnovers, manage the clock, control the tempo of the game, and basically just don't allow Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell to beat you, you're going to be in it at the end with Pittsburgh. Um, this defense, as we're going to get to um, shortly here, is not elite by any means. This is not the Dick LeBeau um, teams of old. This is right. not the uh, you know the Steel Curtain. This is a solid defense with a few playmakers. Honestly, one of their greatest playmakers, one of their best defensive linemen, is on the shelf now. So the Vikings are facing a rebuilding Steelers defense. And uh, if they can basically, if they can keep up offensively, uh, their defense should. You know, the Vikings overall probably have, um, you know, a very solid chance to keep this a game and, you know, make it, you know, make it interesting towards the end. Uh, the difference for me for these two teams just on paper is just the fact that they're playing on the road. Um, you know, if you if this game's at U.S. Bank Stadium, I think a lot of people gravitate more to the Vikings side of the argument yeah. for this weekend. Uh, at the same time, let's keep in mind here that this is a this is a. This is a game where the Vikings are going to be tested regardless of how Pittsburgh looked last week, but it is it is worth noting here that this is a team that the Vikings can contend with, and honestly, this is a team that the Vikings have to get used to beating um, if they do expect to go somewhere um, this season, um, you know, beyond the wild card round. So uh, it'll be a great test. Um, Let's let's talk a little bit about this uh, Steelers offensive line real quick here. Uh, the matchups for Everson Griffin, Daniil Hunter, and Co. this week. Uh, before we move over um, to the other side of the football here, um, Everson Griffin is obviously going to be lined up against the left tackle for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He's Alejandro Villanueva. He's got a great story behind him. I personally think that he's a solid, maybe slightly above average left tackle, but he's nothing that. Everson Griffin can't handle, in my opinion. Um, same, you know, the same could kind of be said about Marquise Pouncey. Obviously, one time a very, very good center. He's digressed over, uh, excuse me, regressed over the last couple seasons here, and his injuries have hurt him as well. Um, but other than those two, and then uh, uh, along with uh, David DeCastro as well, who was a first-round pick a couple of years back here at right guard, uh, this offensive line is definitely beatable. Uh, Marcus Gilbert, the right tackle position, uh, subpar, maybe average at the absolute best, and Ramon Foster, a left guard on the left side, um, maybe average at the absolute best. That might be putting it kindly. So I don't think that this offensive line is anything the Vikings defensive line can't handle. Obviously, it's one of the best defensive lines in the NFL. Uh, the biggest 
challenge that I think the Vikings defensive line faces against this offensive line is simply how quickly Ben Roethlisberger will get the ball out of his hands uh, from time to time and just how mm-hmm. the play calling is schemed up um, you know, to get the Vikings kind of leaning back on their heels. Um, basically, if the Vikings can kind of uh, get into a rhythm defensively and sort of get a general clue of what Todd Haley is trying to do to them. So they're, you know, not one step no, behind. Know when to attack, you know. Yes. Yeah. You got to yeah. know when, when to get aggressive. Yeah. Basically the goal here is, and the, again, this is easy, much easier said than done here, but the goal is to not be a step behind the entire time. If you can keep pace with what the, what Todd Haley is trying to do with, against you offensively um, and kind of line up when those five and seven step drops are going to come. This is a very beatable offensive line. Right. I think these tackles um, deserve a little bit more credit than you gave them. I think Villanueva and Gilbert are both um, probably both what top 15 to top 10 in that range um, at left and right tackle. Uh, Again, I think Griffin and Hunter are, you know, and, you know, the left and right ends on defense. So um, I would still give them the advantage, but I think the offensive line is better than the Saints offensive line if we're going to compare one to week two here. So I I think the Vikings can still get pressure on Big Ben. I think it's going to be important because I think Big – I mean, although Big Ben is very um, poised and he's not vulnerable to making huge mistakes when pressured a la Eli Manning, um, he's still – I mean, any quarterback is going to be flustered by pressure at some point. You know, there's always some breaking point. So getting pressure on Ben Roethlisberger, bring him to the ground completely um, is going to be important because that guy doesn't go down easy. Um, right. But yeah, I think the offensive line, again, I think this, the main task I would put on the defensive line is being disciplined against the run against Le'Veon Bell, not letting him um, exploit you with his patience and vision, instead kind of making him come to you and then for you know, three yards instead of going for that two to three yard loss. Right. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's always about stopping the run first with Mike Zimmer's defense. That's been the calling card of this unit. And, you know, to some extent they haven't necessarily done a great job of stopping the run throughout Mike Zimmer's tenure. Honestly, they've been much better uh, covering the pass uh, from my vantage point, at least. But at the same time, we saw a very solid run stopping performance last week. Um, it seemed like guys like Shamar Steffens, Tom Johnson, those kind of the weakest link on that defensive line played very well against New Orleans. Obviously, this is a completely different animal uh, in Pittsburgh. But if you're – basically, if you can just con- – if you can control Le'Veon Bell enough to you know to sort of make Pittsburgh one-dimensional in a sense, kind of similar to what Cleveland was able to accomplish last week. Obviously, Le'Veon Bell still was able to get something like 35 yards, but he was essentially a non-factor relative to what we expect from Le'Veon Bell. Um, that's the recipe for success here. If you can do that, then you'll start forcing Todd Haley to call those five and seven step drops. You'll be able to line up pressure and kind of, you know, have a better understanding of what's going down, you know, relative to circumstance. Um, And if you create those second and third and long situations where basically Pittsburgh has to throw and Le'Veon Bell is, you know, a a sitting duck out there or has to be used as a receiver, which he's, again, he's good at. Uh, but that's not his expertise by any means. So um, any way you can, anything you can do this week to basically throw these guys a little bit off, um, that could be the difference between winning and losing a game against the Steelers. Um, And going back to this offensive line here, if you get them rattled early on, this is not a, you know, this is, we're not looking at Joe Thomas here where he's got, you know, a decade of excellence to fall back on. If you beat uh, Villanueva, early on in the first quarter, this isn't a guy that has the same level of confidence as a top-tier offensive tackle, even if he has been playing like right. one as of late. Um, getting him rattled early on, obviously getting Ben Roethlisberger rattled early on, like you said, uh, these are going to be key su- success this week here. And, you know, at the end of the day, this offensive line is good enough to protect Ben Roethlisberger when the defense is on its heels. But when the defense can kind of key on what the Steelers are trying to do, uh, you saw Cleveland be, you know, get into the backfield a couple times last week. Um, this is an offensive line that can be beaten. You just need to, you know, you need to pick your spots, like you said. And you need to make sure you're right. Because if you pick, mm-hmm. if you send a blitz at Ben Roethlisberger and you're wrong, 
he's the perfect guy to, you know, basically find the you're, spot. You're screwed. Where, yeah, you're screwed. He's the, he's the type of guy that sees where the linebacker came from, basically hits his receiver and replaces the spot with, you know, the football and probably a first down. So you can't make mistakes here. You know, again, this is all – all of this is a lot easier said than done. A lot of it's very cliche, but seriously, when you're facing an offense like this, it really is just about limiting the damage, controlling their playmakers, and just trying to keep them as one-dimensional and just off-kilter yeah. as possible. It's uh, it's almost like you just – I don't want to say this in a way that, like, this might be the wrong way to put it, but you almost want to let them get their 21 points or 20 points or whatever. Let them – don't try and – do too much, you know, because they're going to get theirs, like you said. Let them get theirs and let this offense, which we're going to start talking about now, let this offense beat them with a performance like last week against a defense of roughly the same caliber in Pittsburgh that I think it's it's very similar, and I think the Vikings have the weapons to exploit in the same fashion. Absolutely. So let's get into this defense like you just said here. Um, generally speaking, this is a 3-4 look. Uh, the defensive coordinator now in Pittsburgh is Keith Butler. If you're not familiar with Keith Butler, uh, I'm not shocked by any means. He replaced Dick LeBeau <laughs> um, after LeBeau moved on. Um, the Steelers, when, they, when the two sides parted ways there, um, and you saw Butler take over. He was the linebackers coach throughout uh, a couple of the Super Bowls there. Um, he's basically going to be running the same 3-4 front, um, you know, exotic defense, plenty of blitzes, um, all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, they're going to move their pass rushers all over the formation. Um, this is a different de- – this is a very different defense than we saw last week against New Orleans um, simply in its, you know – in its infrastructure, right? The way it's built, where their playmakers can be found um, along their defensive unit. Um, we'll start with the defensive line here. Cameron Hayward is their left defensive end. Uh, Javon Hargrave is their nose tackle. And then typically it's going to be Stefan Tuitt at the right defensive end position. Obviously this is a 5-10 technique in a 3-4 scheme here. Uh, but Tuitt is injured. He hurt his biceps. They thought it was going to actually be a season-ending injury. Luckily for him, he's considered week-to-week, so I don't expect to see him. Uh, that moves Tyson Alualu uh, into a starting role here. Um, and obviously, uh, based off how of, how they're mixing up their fronts, um, you're going to see those three guys plus probably one of the edge rushers from that linebacker level. It's either going to be a guy like T.J. Watt, the rookie out of Wisconsin, or... Um, the uh, Bud Dupree, who is, I believe, heading into his third year here, um, f- former first-round pick that has been largely unsuccessful to date, um, somewhat due to injuries, somewhat due to on-field performance. So, uh, Drew, what do you what do you see from this defensive front, um, particularly defensive line? Is this something the Vikings can handle? Is this something that Dalvin Cook can break through, um, or is this going? To, are we going to finally see sort of the regression to the mean for the offensive line this week? Well, I mean, we've um, we have we, we talked last week about how the Saints' defensive line has you know playmakers like Rankins and Cameron Jordan. I think that duo is better than any duo you can put together in the Pittsburgh. You know, whether it's defensive line or those outside, you know, those pass rushers. So, I mean, I'm not I don't want to be too optimistic here, but I think the Vikings the the, the main uh, obstacle is going to be. Um, Dealing with the three four versus the four three, right? Um, you know the different blocking schemes you have to do, and then identifying what is you know because the Steelers are very good at disguising things, sure. so that they don't have necessarily the most talented playmakers, but they disguise things very well. And it's going to be, a, I mean, last week I think Sam Bradford said Pat Elfline called things out really well at the line of scrimmage mm-hmm. for a rookie, but it's going to be a completely different against the Steelers defense that you can never tell what's happening. So. That's going to be the biggest biggest um, worry for me with this Pittsburgh defensive line and the linebackers is figuring out exactly what's happening and um, cor- correctly calling it, I guess. Yeah, um, the line calls will be extremely important. Obviously, like you said, Elfline uh, did a tremendous job by all accounts last week. Um, it does help that he plays in between two guys that have also made long, uh, line calls um, throughout their career in Easton yeah. and Berger. Um, so that is a benefit that the Vikings do have heading into this week. Um, 
But, you know, like you said, this is – it really just – kind of on both sides of the ball, it really just comes down to discipline. Uh, making sure that you're wrapping up on – in solo tackle situations. Make sure you're running to the ball um, as soon as it – you know, it gets out of Roethlisberger's hands or as soon as it gets into Le'Veon Bell's hands, whatever it is. Um, it, it's a lot of, you know, basic stuff. Uh, that is going to help the Vikings win this game. I really think they can match Pittsburgh talent for talent. Um, you know, it's pretty much across the board. I mean, obviously guys like Roethlisberger, Brown, and Bell are in a league of their own. But Delvin Cook, Stephon Diggs, and Sam Bradford are by no means slouches at these same positions. So I think the Vikings actually match up uh, pretty well offensively against the Steelers' defense. Um you know, like you said, there's going to be uh, so question marks in terms of can the Vikings, uh, you know, get themselves uh, integrated into what's going to be a much more complex uh, defensive scheme uh, trotted out by the Steelers this week versus last week. But at the same time, like you said, there aren't a ton of playmakers on this team. And there's honestly, there's a ton of holes at basically every level. Uh, we just mentioned the fact that Stefan Tuit, uh, their big money uh, five technique is going to be is you know essentially by all accounts is going to be out this week. Uh, that exposes Tyson Alualu, who you know if you remember him in Jacksonville, he's an okay player. He's a backup caliber player, but that's certainly a player that uh, I think that you would expect the Vikings to win that matchup with. Uh, then you get to the second level and you see Ryan Shazier in the middle there. Um, obviously a very talented, rangy linebacker that yep. can move all over the field, um, that can pass rush, that, you know, a very efficient tackler. On, you know, he, he fits the Steelers brand. Um, but then next to him, you've got yeah. Bu- you've got Bud Dupree, who I said, as I said earlier, has been largely unsuccessful at the NFL level. Uh, part of that is, you know, a lot of people blame it on his bend, which is a bit of a, I guess, let's call it an advanced scouting term. Uh, if you're not familiar, basically, he's the type of guy that's not able to con- contort his body to create the best possible angle. Um, from off from off the edge. That's what makes T.J. Watt, for example, a more, I guess, dependable uh, guy in terms of creating pressure and creating sacks. Um, but you know, then you see Vince Williams as well. Uh, basically, at the second level, you've got Ryan Shazier, who you're confident in. You got a rookie in T.J. Watt, who looked very good against Cleveland last week and has you know promise. And you've got a couple of question marks in Bud Dupree and Vince Williams, where you don't really know what you're going to get from those two guys. And mixed in with that three-man front that we talked about before, you know, arguably their most important cog in that three-man front being out, you know, that's basically, we're looking at seven of the 11 primary starters on this team, and you've got a lot of question marks fluidly yeah. throughout the first and second level of the Pittsburgh defense. Right. That's the I forget James Harrison, uh, the 40-something-year-old or whatever. He's, he's like the second youngest right. player or oldest player on – NFL defense, yeah. I mean, he got four snaps last week, so we better pay attention to him. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I think you, what you said about these linebackers is correct. I really like Ryan Shazier, though. I think he, in coverage, too, I think he's really um, showed a lot of promise. Um, so, I guess it's not really promise. He's he's probably been in the league for a while now. Uh, past that point where he's a young player, aren't we? Um, but, point is, I think Shazier's a really good player, and I think he could contain you know, Rudolph or Delvin Cook out of the backfield or whatever it is. But I do think Williams, Dupree, Watt, whoever else would drop back in coverage there um, would be a prop, would be something the Vikings should exploit. So, yeah, I, I think um, if you look at, I mean, if it's Rudolph or whoever gets handed off to Watt, Dupree, Williams, et cetera, I think you try and target that if you can. Absolutely. And then you look at this, uh, this defensive secondary here, which is um... – this is probably the Achilles heel of the Steelers. If the Steelers, you know, get bounced in the wild card round of the postseason this year and, you know, uh, fail to live up to their expect their preseason expectations in a big way, it's probably going to be because of this defensive secondary. Uh, this is a unit that, you know, like I just said with the previous two um, levels of their defense, has a lot of question marks. Obviously, you just bring in Joe Hayden, who was cut – um, after, you know, a, lo- a very long, a successful tenure in Cleveland that did not finish too well as of late. He comes to Pittsburgh. He did not play well against Cleveland in his debut with the Steelers last week. He's your kind of your number one cornerback per se. Um, and then opposite him is Artie Burns, who we mentioned on the last show here. Um, I believe he's entering his third season now, um, or excuse me, his second season. 
Um, so he was drafted in the first round. Um, and I think a lot of people were a little bit shocked that he was taken in the first round out of Miami. Um, he has, um, he's been okay to date. Uh, I don't want to say he's been, you know, he's been overly bad or that he's been overly good. He's kind of just done his job. Um, but he also gets beaten a ton. He's a younger player. We know what happens with young cornerbacks and how long it takes them to, to develop. So right. Hayden and Burner, Hayden and Burns are going to be um, your two outside guys. Um, and then in the middle there, you got Sean Davis and Mike Mitchell. Mitchell being a veteran safety. Sean Davis being um, a relatively young player at the strong safety position. So that you know that four man starting secondary in Pittsburgh is. Um, it leaves a lot to be desired, I suppose, and I certainly right. like the Vikings matchups. Stephon Diggs on Hayden um, or Thielen on Burns. Um, however, I think Cody Sensabaugh is probably their um, their primary slot cornerback. Uh, I like whoever the Vikings line up in terms of their wide receiver versus a defensive they, back. They have I an like advantage. The, yes. I like, I like the matchups across the board yeah. for Diggs, Thielen, even Treadwell to some extent. Yeah, I mean, for one thing, I think Diggs and Hayden, it's what should be the matchup. I think on that, it would be the Vikings, if you look at the Vikings offense perspective on the right side, that's where Hayden's been lining up for Berg. Um, I think that matchup is a heavy favor, or heavily favors the Vikings. Um, I think you, you go at that all day, and I talked about on the last show how Sam Bradford's progression has been right to left, or at least it was in week one, and if they continue that, he'll be seeing a lot of Diggs versus Hayden, and uh, that should, again, favor the Vikings. So, that I'll be looking for. Um, and then I, I, Adam Thielen in the slot, too. I mean, besides Shazier against, um, you know, a covering in zone, um, Thielen in the slot should, again, feast. Because um, these guys, there's mismatches all over the place. Um, and Thielen's, a, again, he's a big dude. I think people forget that he's 6'2", 6'3", right. you know, 200-something pounds. He's a big player. So um, he he will cause mismatches. And, again, I think if you put Diggs on the right, Thielen in the, left, in the right slot, and then you have Treble on the left side. You can really win, um, and that's a, that's a passing attack that can do damage, especially against a secondary like Pittsburgh. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, the last uh, couple factors here in this secondary: William Gay, who um, I'm sure most Vikings fans have fond memories of. He's the guy AP. that that AP, yeah that Adrian Peterson absolutely he's still playing, pulled over. Huh? He's still playing. Yeah, he wow. uh, he's now in sort of a reserve role. I believe he played about 25 snaps last week. Um, so he's gonna he'll be a factor to some degree, um, and then also Anthony Chicolo at the linebacker level. Um, he filled in for Bud Dupree last week while Dupree was out. Um, Dupree is currently listed as limited um, on the Steelers' pr- uh, practice. Excuse me, their injury report for this week. So um, that pretty much rounds out uh, what we're looking at here uh, f- yeah. for the Vikings matchup this Sunday. Um, you know, a lot of Antonio Brown, a lot of Le'Veon Bell. And then defensively, basically just taking advantage of, um, you know, the fact that this is still to some degree a rebuilding unit, whether or not Pittsburgh wants to admit it or not, um, you know, who knows. Uh, But this is largely a rebuilding unit that is just, you know, it's not nearly at the level of it's. This is not a quote Steelers right. defense. This is not a Steelers defense that, as you know, as we have become they, accustomed. They to. scheme like it though. Right. It schemes like a really good defense. It just doesn't have the talented players right. and athletes to fulfill it all the time. So that's right. where sometimes you know it, their their scheme, their coaching, um, sometimes wins you know battles or wins plays for them. But it's not necessarily besides guys like T.J. Watt or Hargrave or Shazier. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, let's finish up here then with uh, our Twitter takes for this week, and then uh, we'll do a yep. uh, final score prediction and round this thing out. Yeah. Um, we got. I asked on Twitter um, if there's any specific matchups that people want highlighted and whatnot, and we got a lot of responses, actually. So we'll try and get through these. Um, all of them will probably have to go pretty quick here, but – We'll kind of combine these ones. We had some questions about Antonio Brown versus Xavier Rhodes. That's from Joshua Gregory at Big Red 32. And then Tyler Stahl at Skull Stahl. They both asked about the Trey Wayne's Bryant matchups and then Antonio Brown versus Xavier Rhodes. So what's your take on those? Uh, I mean, I, I'm with you in that I don't think Xavier Rhodes versus Antonio Brown I, is you know truly the narrative here. Um, Antonio Brown moves around 
all over the place. I know that Z- both Rhodes and Brown have kind of hyped up this individual matchup during their press conferences this week, uh, being that they're from the same hometown. Um, and obviously, I believe both of I believe they actually work out together during the offseason as well. So these two are obviously very familiar with each other. They're excited about the matchup, but I don't think that this is going to be Xavier Rhodes versus Antonio Brown all night long. I think Xavier Rhodes will probably be on Martavis Bryant quite a bit. Um, I think that when... You know, if I had to guess, I would assume that when Antonio Brown moves into the slot, I would expect Terrence Newman to be the one um, in charge of him, probably with some safety help or some linebacker help, uh, depending on you know uh, the you know depending on what type of alignment the Vikings decide to trot out defensively. Uh, so, you know, I think the big the big individual matchup here is probably Waynes versus Bryant because I think that you'll probably see that one the most consistently um, because. Rhodes yeah. will probably be on – I would assume that Rhodes will be on Brown when he's on the outside. How much he plays on the outside, we don't know. Um, but I think that Bryant obviously has his you know, pretty pretty significant advantage over Waynes um, just because he's you know he's a lot more than just a 7, 8, 9 uh, route specialist. Um, he's a go-up-and-get-it type receiver. Um, he create, He's very, very good at winning that 50-50 ball. Uh, and he's he he's basically you know he's an, yeah he's his own weapon. He doesn't need someone else to make a play in order for him to you know spring free for a big touchdown or whatever. Bryant is the type of guy that you know when he's healthy, when he's mentally all there, when he's not suspended, uh, he's extremely dangerous in one-on-one coverage. Um, and that's something that I would be worried about for Trey Waynes this week, uh, just simply based oh, yeah. off what we have seen from him um, to date in his career being, you know, largely successful on those seven, eight, nines, but struggling with, um, you know, those in-breaking routes and those, you know, one to three-step drops kind of timing plays um, that have given him trouble over the course of his career. Right. I mean, I think I think the big matchup is going to be, if there is one, I think it's going to be Bryant versus Waynes, like you said. But this narrative of Rhodes versus Brown, Bryant versus Waynes, like, you know, like they're going to shadow each other. Won't happen. Uh, I'm, you might see Rhodes go to both sides on the outside and cover Brown. But if Brown's in the slot, Rhodes won't go in there. So that will be a, obviously something of concern because um, I don't think Julio Jones goes in the slot like that. I mean, there are elite receivers that don't do that. Now that's why I think Brown is the best in the league. It's just because he can line up literally anywhere and beat you. So anyway, um, next questions from Robert here at Garden 40. Robert. Oh, our offensive line against their their defense, defensive line, outside linebackers, pa- uh, pass rushers, what have you. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm pretty confident in the Vikings' offensive line this week. You know, uh, to it being out is a huge blow. Um, I think that TJ Watt. Really weird to say, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it is weird to say. You're but confident I do, in the Vikings' offensive line. But I, ex- I, I, I honestly do feel fairly confident. I mean, Riley Reef will probably draw TJ Watt, who I like him in that match matchup. That means that Bradford's blindside will be largely protected throughout the night. Um, you know, at the right tackle spot, uh, if it is Bud Dupree on the other side of the formation, or if it's Cameron Hayward, depending on again, uh, depending on the alignment that. Uh, Pittsburgh decides to send out there. Um, you know, I like the Vikings offensive line. It, it, it's weird. It is weird to say, but I think that the Vikings offensive line actually does have an advantage in this situation strictly because the pass rushers on the Steelers either are have question marks in terms of consistency or are rookie TJ Watt, who, as right. we all know, rookies have lapses. It doesn't yeah. matter what your pedigree is. You tend to make mistakes in your first couple of weeks in the NFL. Right. I'm a little bit worried about Hargrave in the middle there just because, um, I mean, the, the rushing or the, the offensive line and the run game last week wasn't ideal in the first two and a half quarters. Um, so I, th- I think he would be the difference there. But otherwise, I'm mostly with you. And it's weird to say, but and I, we're kind of basing this off of one game, which probably isn't fair either. But um, I mean, I think it's a pretty fair, even matchup here. And I think... Uh, yeah, I think Remmers against it would probably be Dupree over there. I, I you know, Remmers won't get many um, easier matchups this year than that, from what I understand. <laughs> so, um, but Elf line against Hargrave, or if it's Berger, Easton, whoever's handling the nose tackle, I think will have will be kind of something I'll be watching for the run game. Um, let's uh, let's see, let's uh, get a next one here um, from our buddy Stephen A. Smith. That's at Steve Pa twenty seven. Um, 
if Thielen is in the slot, who will cover him? And because he says the Steelers seemed a bit unsure, they're rotating guys last week in the slot. Um, but it looks to me like it'll be Mike Hilton. At least he, that's um, who I thought kind of was their favorite there. Um, but they might put William Gay in there. They might move other guys in there. But I, I agree that this is a matchup that the Vikings can exploit. Uh, um, just because, I mean, their corners aren't humongous human beings. Adam Thielen, like I just said, is a very big-bodied receiver. So um, I like the Vikings. Team, you should definitely put him in your starting lineup like I'm doing. Absolutely. You know, um, yeah, I, I'm not I'm not 100% sure who is going to line up in the slot for Pittsburgh. Um, here's what I will say is that the Vikings aren't the only team in the NFL uh, that have depth concerns at the slot cornerback position. This is across the NFL, nickel cornerback is uh, becoming scarce. Um, there are not very many teams – across the league that have yeah. quality at this position. So to see them mixing guys around, uh, I think I think Gay was the primary uh, slot cornerback from, you know, from what I noticed watching the game back uh, ahead of the show. Uh, but I think Sensible actually has, uh, has you know, experience there as well. I think that you could actually see Artie Burns slide in the slot as well. I know that he played there a little bit at Miami. I remember that from um, his college tape. But – I think it's probably going to be William Gay, and like you said, I I like Adam Thielen in that matchup. I think that's certainly something the Vikings can exploit. Yeah. Our last one here from Eli at Skolsees. Um, he has a couple of things, but um, how are the Vikings, land, Vikings linebackers up against Le'Veon Bell, both um, yeah, obviously against the run, and then also if he does go out um, for a run or route uh, in, in a pass play, and um, Tremaine Brock returning. So what do you think about those two things? Uh, Tremaine Brock, real quick, I don't see him being a difference maker this week. I don't really see him having much of an impact. I would expect anywhere between eight and ten snaps. Uh, remember, he's still learning the he's still learning a very complex defensive scheme and a very complex role within that defensive scheme. Um, so I don't think that he. I just don't think it's fair to expect him to be, you know, integrated into the system enough to be a full-time starter just yet. So I don't see a whole lot from him this week. I think it'll probably be Mackenzie Alexander and Terrence Newman uh, combining uh, to get something done there out of the slot this week again. Um, and then as for Anthony Barr and Eric Kendricks, I mean, I said this earlier, uh, they certainly have the athleticism, the instincts, the uh, physical build. Uh, they have all the traits between the two of them to not only stop the run effectively, um, whether it's Bell running it or whether it's, you know, the Adrian Peterson that used to play for the Chicago Bears. Uh, I don't care who it is. Uh, these two linebackers can do everything. It's just a matter of, like we said earlier, discipline, good preparation, hitting the right gaps, and picking their spots. So I certainly think the Vikings are have the line, have the the right pair of linebackers in Barr and Kendricks to stop a guy like Le'Veon Bell who can hit you in so many different ways. Uh, but it's a matter of will the, will Barr, you know, will he stay yeah. disciplined? Will Kendricks struggle with his tackling? We've seen him have issues, you know, with solo tackles, shooting the gaps um, throughout his career. Um, this has got to be a game where both of them are on point, which both players are, you know, to, say, to put it kindly, have been – have had you know very very strong points in their career and also very very low lows as well. So it depends on which which Anthony Barr and which Aunt Eric Kendricks we get this weekend. But if we get the guys that you know we've come to love, um, I certainly think they're capable of slowing down Bell. Yeah, I mean I'm very scared of Le'Veon Bell, and I'm especially scared of Le'Veon Bell if Anthony Barr doesn't play. Yes. So um, if it's Ben Gideon out there, I, I do not like trying, that matchup. Yeah, no. yeah, exactly. So. Uh, I, I do think Hendricks and Barr can, can match up with them, but again, it's going to be about the discipline. It's going to be about not being too aggressive, which Kendricks has been guilty of in the past and Barr. So that'll be, key, that'll be key. But I think, again, if Barr's gone and Gideon's in there, then Le'Veon Bell will light up the Minnesota Vikings. So um, with that, that's the end of our um, questions here. So I guess we can go into our final score prediction here, BJ. Uh, lead us off. Um, I'm going to take the Vikings to win this one. I'm going to say, Ooh. I mean, what did, what did I say last week for the Saints game? 24 to 21. Um, I think Something I'll just, like I'll, I'll go 27, 21 Vikings this week. Um, okay. Like we've been talking about the whole show, big Ben's going to big Ben, Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell. They're going to get theirs. It's just a matter of whether or not Sam Bradford right. can keep up for the record. I think he can. For the record. I was two points off last week. I said 27, 19 Vikings and it was 29, 19. So I'd like to make that 
clear that you know I'm smart and I know football. No, um, clearly, clearly, I will say Steelers win this game because I'm I'm just too scared of Brown and Bell. Those are your the two again the two best um, I don't have position a players in the NFL. Um, I'm gonna go Steelers, 27 Vikings 24. I think it's gonna be close, and I think the Vikings hang with them. And you know I don't want to say the typical Vikings fashion gets in the way at the end, but I feel like you know something will happen. But um, it'll be a fun game. I think this will be. You have two pretty good offenses. You have from what I me mean, from week one anyway, the Vikings, and then I think you have again the two best skill position players in the league, and you have two defenses that um, are very exotic, very creative. I just think that the Bell and Brown combination gives the Steelers the upper hand. So twenty-seven, twenty-four Steelers. I'm perfectly okay with that. Um, you know, I'm I feel like I am to some degree going out on a limb by picking the Vikings to win this week. So um, I think this I think that if you are you know betting this game, I would probably favor. Pittsburgh. I mean, they're playing at home. This is a, uh, uh, this is arguably the number two team in the AFC. You know, uh, there's a reason why they've been picked one of the by toughest some... places in the NFL to go play and win a road right. game. So. Right. Yeah, I'm perfectly fine with you know uh, projecting the predicting that the Vikings are going to lose this game. But um, coming off of Week One, I expect Sam Bradford to keep rolling, and uh, I expect big things, which ends in a Vikings victory. So we're split here uh, between the two of us. Um, if you're interested in seeing the rest of Drew and I's week two picks, uh, that will be up on Vikings territory uh, as usual. Uh, last week, I finished 6-9, and nine and Drew finished 9-6. Nice. and six. So I've got some catching up to do, uh, and we'll see what happens this week. But um, as always, thanks for listening. Um, hope you guys enjoyed uh, the pregame analysis uh, for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, and we will be back um, – Monday uh, with a immediate instant reaction um, to the Vikings game um, on Sunday afternoon. And uh, make sure to check out the pregame show uh, that we're planning on having up on Shindig. Um, that will be uh, probably go live at about an hour before game. So you can expect about 11 a.m. Central Time on Sunday. So uh, once again, thanks for listening. Uh, you can find us, as always, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Vikings Territory, iHeartRadio. You know where we're at. Um, and we will catch you guys after a Vikings win this weekend. Thanks, guys.